This little Chinese bowl once belonged to Queen Elizabeth I. It's made of a material which was unknown in Europe until the 1500s. And when that material arrived, it caused a sensation. In the 16th century, porcelain became a cult item amongst the very wealthy. The intelligentsia and the aristocracy kept porcelain in their cabinets of curiosity. By the 18th century, the fever had spread to the middle classes. People are so mad for it that they're getting into debt. They're going bust. They're wasting their family's wealth. The making of porcelain was shrouded in mystery. European potters tried in vain to copy it. Chinese porcelain is probably really the most misunderstood material in ceramic history. The insatiable demand created a global trade. The blue and white imagery on the wares changed our idea of what was beautiful. The British dining table would never be the same again. I had porcelain fever for most of my life. And the best way to tell the story of how blue and white porcelain arrived in the West from China is to go there. I'm going to the source, to one of the world's first industrial cities. I'll follow the route taken by millions of cups, plates and bowls to try to find out why these wares were so prized then and now. It's a story ripe for the telling because now it's the Chinese who've got the fever. The new emperors are buying back their history, making Chinese porcelain some of the most expensive art ever to come under the hammer. One million pounds, ladies and gentlemen. One million five hundred thousand. One million seven hundred thousand. The Victoria and Albert Museum in London is home to objects that define the British. On the sixth floor, there's a collection about control and our ability to lose it. Between the 17th and 18th centuries, the aristocrats and merchants of England became increasingly hungry for Chinese porcelain. At its height, in the mid-18th century, it's estimated that over two million pieces of porcelain arrived in London. And that was at a time when the whole population of these islands was no more than around six million. It wasn't just this magical, white, translucent material that interested them, but it was the images of a far distant, mysterious place, Cathay, China. Over the years, I've been involved with many ceramic valuations. My job's been to look at vases, plates, dishes, owned by people whose ancestors just had to have them, whether they were new at the time or had become antiques. And it's those successive waves of China mania which have brought us these fabulous national collections that we have. But how did this love affair with Chinese porcelain start? How was the trade regulated? And just what was it that gave it its value? Was it the nature of the porcelain itself? Or did it have something to do with the complexity of bringing it from China to Europe? Like any consumer craze, it started with a gap in the market. In Europe, in the 16th or 17th century, all you would have seen were stonewares and earthenwares, quite uh, rough pots. And suddenly you see something which is thin as paper, white, shiny, translucent, and you wonder what on earth this magic substance is. In fact, early Europeans didn't know what porcelain was. They thought it was some kind of precious stone. Porcelain was harder than our toughest stonewares. If you hit it with a spoon, it rang like a bell, but it didn't flake, chip or scratch. It was resistant to heat and the color didn't fade. It was very hard, it was white, and when you held it up to the light, you could see it was translucent. Better still, it came from far off China, and only the Chinese knew how to make it. All over Europe, scientific gentlemen experimented in vain to try to work out 
what made porcelain so fine. Collectors were obsessed. There was a fortune to be made. The swank value of porcelain was quite high. In fact, in many cases, porcelain even replaced precious metals like gold and silver. A beautiful, exotic, hard-to-get product in limited supply. The Portuguese and Dutch had been first to the source, so the British aristocracy had to beg, borrow or steal it. In 1602, they did just that. When a Portuguese boat loaded with porcelain was stolen by the Dutch in mid-ocean, it came up for auction. The kings of France and England bid against each other. These are very exclusive, very high-status luxury items for the mega rich. And the person who really kicks it all off in England is Queen Mary II in the late 17th century. Now, she had spent time in the Low Countries. The Dutch are a great trading nation. She got hold of loads and loads of porcelain when she'd been living over there before she came to England. And you can really see in the royal collection, Charles I, he has some porcelain. He has about 60 items. Mary II, 50 years later, she's got 800. What had begun in the 16th and 17th centuries as the importation of occasional pieces of blue and white porcelain for princes in their palaces became, in the 18th century, the maladie de porcelain, the porcelain sickness, when every self-respecting merchant and his household filled every nook and cranny, every shelf, with Chinese porcelain. Today, we tend to eat off plain white plates, but generations of British homemakers have jollied up their interiors with blue and white china. The idea that utilitarian objects could also be works of art was revolutionary and would be a profound influence on our aesthetics. To many, however, this was just an opportunity for conspicuous consumption. One of the best descriptions of China mania comes from Daniel Defoe. And he's writing in the early 18th century. He says that you need to put it on your tables, you need to put it on your writing table, it's on your cabinet, it's right up to the top of the ceiling. It's being displayed on these shelves in people's houses. And people are so mad for it that they're getting into debt. They're going bust, they're wasting their family's wealth. The world had gone mad for China. So how did this rare product, available only to the few, become a craze amongst the emerging middle class? It was thanks to the business savvy of the most powerful corporation the world has ever seen, the East India Company. The East India Company, I think we can look at as being the mother of the modern uh, corporation. It existed in the import-export business, exporting bullion to Asia to bring in uh, luxury goods, uh, spices, textiles and tea and porcelain uh, from China. From Leadenhall Street in the city of London, the company controlled the supply and fed the demand for porcelain because they had a monopoly on all British trade with the East. Today, there isn't so much as a brass plaque to mark the place where their mansion offices stood. Another monument to global trade now occupies the plot, Lloyd's of London. At its height, um, it had a very grand uh, classical uh, headquarters, um, perhaps something like the, the British Museum in terms of its sort of style, sort of with, with the classical frontage. A very, very big uh, building with its own museum inside and also its, its auction house where every quarter there would be the, the sale of all the goods, which are supposed to be so sort of now loud and noisy that people could hear them outside and there'd be that shouting and yelling as people tried to, to, to get their price for the, the, the goods. The corporation docks were at Blackwall. They had chandleries, sail lofts, mast houses, careening beds, and an army of stevedores toting bales of cotton, silks, spices, tea, and of course, porcelain by the hundredweight. It was from here that the company ships known as East Indiamen sailed out to find the trade winds. These breezes are a meteorological conveyor belt. They took the ships down the coast of Africa, around the Horn, out across the Indian Ocean, through the Malacca Straits, and into the South China Seas, where hordes of pirates lay in wait. For the China trade, these were the biggest ships. These were the 1,000, 1,200 tonne ships, both having a sort of obviously commercial purpose, but also able to, to fight off uh, marauders and pirates. But there were huge dangers of dying. I mean, two, about a half, two-thirds of people never came back. 
For those who made it, the port of entry was Guangzhou, or Canton. And it's where my Chinese journey begins. Today, China is a holiday destination. Then, it was as alien as the moon. Except we knew what the moon looked like. Welcome to China. If you'd come here in the 18th century, the scene out there in the dusk would have been one of a flotilla of European ships, all bobbing at anchor, their lights twinkling, occasional sounds of sailors singing. These were the sailors who'd come halfway across the world. In their minds, the celestial empire, as portrayed in blue and white China, a land of romance. And what happened? They got to here, known to the European sailors as the Huampoa Anchorage. And this was where they had to stop. The emperor in faraway Beijing was not minded to allow traders to penetrate further than his southern doorstep. They were confined to Canton, and even then only the port area. There was a view that uh, many of the, the Europeans and so on were little more than pirates uh, and were to be discouraged because of the disruption they could cause. There were two very good reasons for keeping the foreigners here in Canton. The first was to prevent the barbarian influence on the Chinese Empire. The second, more importantly, was to prevent China's own secrets from leaking out into the West. And one of these secrets, of course, was the method of making porcelain. The Europeans were confined to port, and their orders for tea sets and dinner services were taken up country by Chinese middlemen, known to Europeans as hoppos. Even in modern times, it's been difficult for foreigners to get permits to visit certain areas. But today, I can go to the place where all porcelain came from, the fabled town of Jingdezhen. Eighteenth-century accounts tell of a warren of streets and alleyways and a population that consumed 10,000 loads of rice and 1,000 hogs every day. It's in the middle of nowhere and very difficult to get to. The reason the town it makes all this porcelain is because of its fantastic natural resources. The materials at Jingdezhen are particularly rich and so that's why it was given an imperial decree in the year 1004. Remote and inaccessible, the town was literally built on the secret ingredients that made porcelain. What happened uh, in Jingdezhen is that until the early 10th century, it was making a stoneware material that had a grey-green ash glaze. And this had really been made in South China since the Bronze Age. What seems to have happened in the 10th century uh, AD is that Chinese potters discovered that there was another local rock. And if they processed this in exactly the same way, they could produce um, a white material rather than um, this old grey-green stoneware. The rock they discovered was mined in the hills above the town. Every day, for a thousand years, these paths were trodden by laborers ferrying basketfuls down the slopes. And the product they were carrying, an essential ingredient in 99% of the pieces of porcelain we find in European country houses, is named after this mountain, Mount Gaolin. And the material we call Gaolin. Tropical to sub zero. It's very cold in here. And to think that every day these men from the village below came a thousand feet up the hill into holes like this, quarrying for Kaolin, buckled under the weight as they carried it back down again. And the fact that these workmen probably didn't live that long, 